when you think back to all of the internal and external facets of Aaron Bell, the hair, the look, the gait, the voice, and then also the backstory and what we learn about her. What was, as far as the internal and the external, the most important things that helped you unlock her? Um, I mean, I always start internally just because that's the, um, it, it, that's basically how I choose a role because it affects me emotionally. And, um, and also I'm obviously very director um, driven. So I go, okay, um, what's my connection to the director and what are they going to bring out of me? And I think I'd already met Karen and we'd, um, we'd established a relationship prior to reading the script. So I sort of knew um, her sensibilities and what she was aiming to do with her career and the story she was trying to tell. And um, I just found Erin deeply emotional because of her, I think, the way in which she's made choices that have left her incredibly scarred and damaged and um, the way in which she's somehow trying to heal those even though she knows she's not going to save her own life. And the idea of saving her daughter's life mm. or giving her daughter a different life to hers, um, even though she's made terrible mistakes in raising her child, that to me is deeply emotional. And so that's how I went in. And then out of that came how do we build this, this woman externally and I know people have said, well, why does she look so d damaged? Mm. But I think when you know why, well, I mean, but it's interesting because, you know, she's she's not 60. She's, um, she, it's 17 years after. She's sort of late 40s, but she's really, really, um, you know, she's inflicted a lot of damage on her body and um, obviously her psyche's been damaged, but she's got, she's, she doesn't care anymore about what she's, what's going to happen to her. And she has a line in the film, which is, and as an actor, you're always looking for these, these, what I call the jewels, because they're the things that give you the history, um, where she says, I don't care what happens to me. Well, a person that doesn't care what happens to them is a very dangerous person. <laughs> so that was sort of those little things. And then obviously the, um, the line that the daughter says where she talks about how, oh, uh, you know, don't tell me how your mother used to burn you with cigarettes and the way. Well, that there is in one line a whole history of her abuse and the way in which she's been raised by her own mother which has caused incredible damage. So that's the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you and Phil have been writing together for many years. I just learned backstage that you've known each other since you were about 18 years old. Matt, can you tell me a little bit about where kind of the genesis or germ of this script came from for you guys? Yeah, we, um, you know, we obviously love stories about LA because we're, I grew up here, Phil and Karen have both lived here for a long time. Um, love cop movies and always wanted to kind of work on one. I've been inspired by those films of the 70s. And uh, we had an idea, we had a structure in mind for how to tell this cop story about, you know, someone ultimately searching for themselves. We had this circular structure in mind. And uh, so we, we, this is about 10 years ago, and we would pick it up and put it down. And we had some kind of touchstone scenes that supported this back and forth with the past. But what really uh, made it click for us was when we finally hit upon the character of Aaron Bell. It had to be this woman. It had to be Aaron. It had to involve this relationship with her daughter. And from then on, kind of the why of telling this story and the really fell into place and made it um, not easy, but easier. And then, Phil, given the fact that you and Karen are not only professional partners, but partners in life as well, at what point like, do you decide, like, now is the time for me to tell Karen about this and hope that she might do it, or is she in on it from the very beginning? She's always aware of what we're doing, <laughs> our whereabouts at all times, creatively and literally. It'd be strange if she wasn't. Yeah, um, it makes it sound like I'm like ruling the house with an iron artistic fist. panopticon. <laughs> um, we uh, we sort of knew 
we really always aim now as this kind of family unit to 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 do these things together. So we're always aiming toward uh, uh, Karin's vision and voice, and we see it as trying to see we have this story and then and this character, and then we want to see it through Karin's eyes, and then we want to help however we can Nicole's process, seeing try to see her through Nicole's eyes as well, all together. And I think that we th in this case very early we sort of knew what was important and talked to that about with Karin before we even got too deeply into the structural stuff. And it was just the emotional core of this story and wanting to tell a story about this woman who could be everything in this movie, who wasn't just a, 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 a vehicle to deliver a story that we really were intensely invested in together telling the story about a woman who could be who lived every facet of a life that we could possibly try to portray. So we did that very, um, we early knew what the, what the heart was for us. And then Karn would kind of, we now know, have known each other for a really long time. Plummy too, it's a lot of our key collaborators, Teddy, the composer. And so we can kind of organically move forward all together. So, but, but while we're writing the script, Karin is already working on the visuals for the movie because we've talked it through in detail and Teddy is already writing music based on the script and Plummy is probably the second or third person who ever reads the script. So there's this sort of organic progression. Karin, from your, from your standpoint, what was most important to you as far as creating this intensely unsettling, often seedy atmosphere that you feel so viscerally as you watch this movie? Um. That's an interesting question and kind of a hard one to answer, but I feel like I wanted us to, what felt most important to me was that as you watch the movie, whether you like it or not, you start to become intimate with this character. You start to feel closer to understanding something about her, whether you like her or don't like her or sympathize with her or don't. I just wanted the audience to have the experience of really watching a life lived and the choices be considered and the sense that in some ways she's made a very, very bold, brave step mm. to be accountable for, for some of her mistakes. Mm. Those who don't want spoilers who are watching this on YouTube, come back after you've watched the movie. But for those of you who are gonna stick around and be a little bit brave and bold, um, Plummy, I'd be curious to know from your point of view, how the kind of, I mean, this movie pulls the rug from under the viewer in the coolest way, 15 minutes from the end. How did that device in Phil and Matt's script affect the way you approach this as the editor? Well, um, it, it, I always knew that I had to find a way for, and Karn obviously was doing this in the direction, but find a way to make it believable that that spoiler first scene is <laughs> not really the first scene. So to have that be, um, be believable in the end, and ha what ended up I think being the biggest challenge with the film in the editing was how much information do we give and when do we give it enough for people to hold on to but uh, not so much that they get kind of lost in the in the in the forest right. so yeah it was tricky Fred from your point of view I mean you've done films of so many different kind of levels of scope and budget and you know production scale what springs to mind if I were to ask you what the biggest challenge was on this one from a production standpoint? It's funny, we talk a lot about the challenges and as we've been discussing the movie lately, and I sort of think about the movie in two very distinct ways. One, the sort of gargantuan distance between our set of resources and the ambition <laughs> that Karin implicitly brings to her work and that was uh, integral to the script itself, the, <clears throat> the scope, the scale, the time periods. Shooting in LA is the most expensive place to shoot in the world. Um, two bank heists, because one isn't enough, and, and <laughs> various things that you've just seen. Um, so that level of just production DNA coupled with what we had was sort of an impossible task. And yet my experience of making the movie, because you have, first of all, a script that's so polished and so precise and kind of you couldn't take the dominoes out. We really tried. We're like, we don't have enough time to shoot this, so where does it, and we just couldn't find it. And um, 
And then you have a director who's just so experienced. She's walking on set with so much experience shooting film and television and huge, as you talk about, different scope and scale and uh, big studio movies and indies. And so has been through it all and brings just an insane amount of preparation, meticulous uh, planning for every scene and every set piece in a way that kind of just makes our jobs effortless. So um, then you also have, you know, one of our greatest actors working at the height of her powers. And all I remember is just a responsibility a feeling intense sort of sacred responsibility to just kind of protect that and encourage it and, and just create a bubble where they were just free to work because there's already two great producers uh, when I joined the literal family, as you noted. So my recollection of the movie is actually quite effortless, even though uh, I know that there was a point where it felt really daunting. Was there anything, I mean, I'm thinking back to the myriad crazy things that Aaron Bell does in this movie from putting Petra's very alive body in the trunk <laughs> to getting shot, to the very friendly visit at the guy's house who's in that hospital bed. Was there anything that you read in the script for a first time and you thought, oh my God, like, am I gonna be able to do this? Did anything give you pause? I'm so crazy that no. <laughs> um, no. I just saw it as like, okay, this, let's go. I've never been to these places and I'm ready to, to do this. But what was great, and this is where you always go, ah, oh, this is why you never fight anything. Because of the limitations of the budget, we were shooting in real locations. We were hustling to get things done every day. We were losing shots and Karen was having to go, I, I wanted that shot so badly, but I'm going to give that... But, you know, the house where I pay the visit, um, the home visit, um, <laughs> and that house actually had, was it 20 or 30 cats living in it? Yeah. So it smelt of cat's piss. Um, it was so putrid when we walked in. But that's fantastic as an actor because it was like I walked in, I couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> but all of that plays in to you know and because there were those locations that was fantastic and that's why then we were shooting um you know at night in really dangerous places <laughs> and that is that's there you can feel it or I could feel it in my body and in the and the way in which I would move and people talk to me about how I started to walk I wasn't aware of any of that that just started to happen because of the internal injuries, because of the um, my own depression while I was making it. And <laughs> it just started to weigh on me. Well, those things are invaluable as an actor. And that's why I think you never, you never fight anything, whatever you're given, whether it's a budget, location, suddenly you have to lose scenes, suddenly things have to be rewritten. You go with the flow. And it's one of the greatest lessons. Mm. And I actually learnt it originally from Kubrick. And Kubrick, no matter what happened, he would change and make the scene better. Wow. And he would never go and fight for a location if it was too expensive. He was like, oh, we'll get something better. And he, that's how he operated. Mm. And then he would sort of massage things and watch things and watch them percolate and adjust accordingly. And it was one of the greatest lessons as an actor to start with him and then to keep applying it through my whole career. Well, I thank you all for making our brains explode tonight. Thank you so much.